So, uh, Professor Conyers, I wanted to, um, I've been waiting for a long time to talk to you about this particular subject. I know you And know. it's, uh, it's Blyden. Okay. When I say Blyden, what, do I, what am I talking about? What am I saying about Blyden? What, what's, what's his whole name? Where, where he from? Blah, 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 blah. Go ahead. Because you, you, no, you know. Okay. Let me just first, first say that Blyden, uh, properly Edward Wilmot Blyden, was <coughs> one of the great Pan-Africanist nationalists of, of, of the history of African people. Unfortunately, well, some people would say he's one of the first. The, well, they say founding fathers, one of the first. Well, I, I said one of the great. You okay. Know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's certainly one of the founding fathers, but there were other others in different mm-hmm. areas like Martin Delaney and others. But mm-hmm. uh, Blyden was uh, born in St. Thomas in 1832. That's of what with this uh, in the Caribbean, the Virgin yeah, Islands. In, yeah, mm-hmm. born in St. Thomas. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I actually went to St. Thomas to visit some years ago to visit the Blyden Society. Okay. to talk about Blyden, mm-hmm. and I did you know, a little bit of a lecture down there about Blyden, but they were very, very familiar with Blyden. Nonetheless, Blyden was one of the great characters of our history. Unfortunately, very few people know about Blyden today, and the reason for that was that he was so far ahead of his time and so misunderstood during his time mm-hmm. that, by and large, he was whited out of history. And uh, hmm. many, many scholars forgot about him for long periods of time. And in fact, much of the revival of Blyden was brought together by a scholar by the name hmm. of uh, Hollis Lynch, who wrote hmm. a book, Pan-Negro Patriot, on, on Blyden. My interest in Blyden came about through Dr. J- the great scholar, Dr. John Henry Clark, who mm-hmm. mentioned Blyden a few times in one of his lectures at First World Alliance back in the 1970s and 80s. Yeah, yeah. And it, it piqued my interest in Blyden. So I started doing research on Blyden. I actually even did an interview with Dr. John Henry Clark, which no one has seen, which I have here. Or very few. few well, wh- wh- when, when are people going to see this? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to ever show. But Dr. Marimba Ani has seen it. A few other people have seen it. When you say seen it, well, you, you recorded on what? It's recorded on a videotape, just like what we're doing right now. You know, I recorded. So well, how come we don't put it up on YouTube? Well, uh, I don't know if I want to do that yet. But oh, I'll decide okay. when, when I want to do it. But anyway, okay. I did an interview with Dr. Clark. Mm-hmm. And so nonetheless, Blyden was born in 1832 in St. Thomas, immigrated to the United States in about 1850, but could not stay here. Mm-hmm. And the reason, well, he could have stayed here, but he was fearful of staying here. And the reason for that was that in 1850, the Federal Fugitive Slave Act was passed, slave mm-hmm. law was passed, mm-hmm. which made it very, very easy for Southern slave captures to yeah. capture any black person free or enslaved and mm-hmm. send them into slavery. Bl- Blyden himself was free mm-hmm. in St. Thomas. So mm-hmm. he came here, and while he was here, being fearful of being captured mm-hmm. as a runaway, mm-hmm. he immigrated with the help of the American Colonization Society, he immigrated to a newly independent state in uh, Africa known as Liberia. Liberia was founded in 1822, got his independence in 1847, and mm-hmm. Blyden was told that he could continue his education in uh, Liberia. He came to America actually to go to Rutgers Seminary because he was training to be a Presbyterian minister. Mm-hmm. And he was a brilliant, brilliant person. He exceed, excelled all of the students in uh, in St. Thomas and everywhere else he, he, that he went. Okay, hold on a second. Let, let me go back. This, uh, right. I, I, I don't want to interrupt your flow exactly, right. but let's go to certain ages. Now, you say he was born in, what, 1935? No, no, no 1835. 18, 1832, sorry. 1832. 1832. And, he, and, he, and he got to the States at, at what age? 18. 18. He was 18, and he came, he came here in 1850. But with that early years in, 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 in you know, in the Caribbean, what, what, what was his life like? Was he athletic? Was he, you know, was he brilliant? did he get kicked out of school? Did he not get kicked? What, what's going on? Well, you know, in terms of athletics, <laughs> there were very few athletics that uh, an African in St. Thomas could do at that time. The vast majority of Africans, if we want to talk about athletics at all, on any level, their athletics were working as enslaved Africans okay. on plantations on the island. But his family, and I don't know the reasons why, and I've never been able to find out, mm. and he doesn't explain it himself in his writings, his family, however, were free Africans on the island of St. Thomas. They actually grew, grew up in the nation's capital, uh, the St. Thomas's capital, Charlotte Amelie, and they grew up uh, in close proximity, if not directly in a Jewish community. Mm. And so uh, he went to school (laughs) in a a school that was set up by Presbyterian ministers and became Mm. a brilliant student there. He mastered ancient Hebrew, he mastered Greek, and he was just brilliant. 
Okay, that's what we need to yeah. know. Okay, okay. So we had this family as well. Right. Okay, so so well, now why does he come to the States again? He wants to train with somebody? He's, he's looking no, for something? No, he wants to what, come what? to the States to continue his education. He wants to ah. go to Rutgers Seminary yeah, to continue his yeah. education. He applied to Rutgers, but he was refused because he was black, mm. as well as two other universities or colleges in the United States, and he was mm. refused. But exactly at that time, as I mentioned earlier, That's the fugitive slave law yeah, yeah. came into effect, which threatened him and any other free black, whether they were from here or any place else. And so he thought it wise, with the help of the American Colonization Society, some friends he had in the society who had mm. worked with him over a number of years in his teenage years in the island of St. Thomas, okay. uh, primarily William Coppinger, and another man who was basically his mentor, even in St. Thomas, the Reverend Knox. Mm -hmm. And they told him about this newly independent state called Liberia, which got his independence, as I mentioned earlier, in 1847. Mm -hmm. And he immigrated to Liberia, hoping to continue his, his education at a place in Liberia known as Alexandria, Alexandria, excuse me, Alexandria High School. Okay. And so that was his reason for going. But he had an alt another reason, too, because he was free and he was an intellectual in the early stages of his education. So, well, so you're saying at 18, 19, he knew he was an intellectual. Well, and everybody I, I, else knew, too. Well, I'm not going to say that he knew well, he, when, was, when he was writing stuff. I mean, how, how you he know. was writing. He was writing letters. OK. And he was a brilliant student. This is one of the reasons that he it was recommended that he come to the United States because mm -hmm. he was a brilliant student. Reverend Knox saw that. And in fact, he excelled Reverend Knox in understanding mm -hmm. of ancient Greek, ancient Hebrew and many of his teachings. He's a uh, brilliant, brilliant student. OK, OK, OK. And okay. so it was recommended that he couldn't continue his education on the level that he wanted to in mm -hmm. St. Thomas. So it was recommended that he come to the United States because you had university see where he could possibly continue his education. Once again, he right. was rejected from the universities, but at the same time, the fugitive slave law came into an, uh, uh, into effect in 1850, which threatened in all free blacks in the United States, doesn't matter where they were. So how long was he in the States before he went to Liberia? Oh, maybe a year, the most. Uh, I don't even think it was that okay. long. Okay. To be honest with you, off the top of my head, I forget the length of time that he was actually No, no, you never around, the year, two yeah. years, but it, it was very short. I, I, short I don't even time. think it was that long. I think mm -hmm. it might have been maybe six months, but I don't Ooh, remember okay. exactly how long he was here. <laughs> he came here, had enough. <laughs> right, and in fact, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't mention it himself, mm. exactly how long he's here, but it was a very short period of time because right at the time that he was here, 1850, that's when the law comes into effect. Exactly. So he wasn't here very, very long while he was trying to do these things. I would say anywhere from a few months to a year, but I don't remember exactly, and I do not remember Blyden himself mentioning how long he was here in his writings. Well, you know, uh, I depend on your memory. Right. You're one of the few people, I'm sorry, going off track. You're one of the few people I know. There's a, well, that just remember everything. I can't believe it. You said you've been remembering stuff since you was like three years old, two Even years before old? before that. God, let's just stop yeah. with that. Let's go, go back to Blyden. Okay. So now he's in Liberia. Right. Okay. What's what's he doing in the library? He's well, writing, he's again, writing, I, I, he's going I, I, to school. As I said, the first thing that he wanted to do was go back to school to continue his education. Mm -hmm. You know, again, he was going to be a Presbyterian minister. And so he was going to Liberia to enroll in Alexandria High School to continue his education. Mm -hmm. All right. So that was the first motive. But there was a secondary motive. We have to be, understand mm -hmm. that he was missionary trained. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that missionaries were training African people to think, speak, and act in European terminology. Exactly. So in his early days, Blyden's knowledge and understanding mm -hmm. of African people were that primarily of the European meaning that African people were heathens and, you know, his objective was to go to Afri Africa, and he writes this, to go to Liberia to, by and large, educate and Christianize his heathen, heathen. brothers. Okay, okay. This is in his early days. Mm -hmm. But with his brilliance, he quickly got out of that mode. He began seeing things and understanding things that transformed him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But initially, that was his motivation. Mm. Mm. So what 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 kind of luck I'm gonna say like that did he find in library when I say luck what did he fall into how is he supported you know what I mean um, was he working the docks was he he had uh, some patrons what's going on he was supported by Reverend Knox uh, mm. partially and he was supported by the American Colonization Society remember Liberia oh, they still was with him. okay yeah. yeah Liberia was by and large founded under under the auspices of the American Colonization Society the American mm. Colonization Society was founded. In 1817, mm -hmm. and its motives, by and large, the first president was a man by the name of Robert Finley. And mm -hmm. the motivations, by and large, 
of the American Colonization Society was to get rid of free blacks in the United States. Mm. Something like four or maybe five of the first presidents of the American Colonization Society were all slaveholders. Mm. All right. Mm. And so part of the motivation was if you get rid of the free black population in the United States, which would be people even by their very presence who would be agitators in the sense that even enslaved Africans would see free mm -hmm. Africans mm -hmm. and then want to be free. So their very presence created a problem for uh, slave owners in the system. Oh and boy. so this was part of the motivation. And, you know, I don't know whether it's fortunate or unfortunate. Uh, one of the early people that assisted them, not in their foundation, but with information, believe it or not, was another African, Paul Cuffey, the Cuffey brothers mm -hmm. from Boston. Paul Cuffey, mm -hmm. before the founding, before the, uh, uh, excuse me, before the 19th century, because again, the American Colonization was found, a society was founded in 1817. I don't know if I said 1770 before, but 1870, which is the 19th century. But during the late 18th century mm -hmm. and the beginning of the 19th century, Paul Cuffey, who himself had traveled to Africa, and by and large, he was a rich, free black mm -hmm. in Boston, owned a shipping company, uh, had traveled to Africa, set up a small school in Liberia, mm. and as far as everybody was concerned at that time, he was the foremost expert on all things African. Of course. <laughs> at that particular point in time. Yeah. So he gave information, you know, to the American Colonization Society. Remember, the Liberia mm. had not been founded yet. This mm. is 1817. Liberia doesn't get founded until 1822, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, he's trying to help African people. It's not like he was assisting them to get rid of us. He is trying to help African people by developing schools and so on and so forth mm -hmm. for the education of African people and the development of African people. He put his mm -hmm. own money into this. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's Paul Cuffey. So, again, the American Colonization Society set up the, the wheels in motion to for the founding of Liberia, 1822. And, of course, by 1847, Liberia had got gotten its independence from the United States, if you want to truly call it independence. There's another story behind that. Well, hold on a second. Now, all this, it, isn't this uh, before the Nicene Conference? I mean, is it, I don't understand. Africa wasn't carved up yet, was it? No, we, no. We, the, we, well, you, you said Nice Nicene Conference. I mean, the, um, uh, the, 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 the Berlin, Berlin, the Berlin Conference, conference right. I meant. Uh, all right, okay. Uh, uh, the Berlin, Berlin Conference, 1884 and 1885. So this is before then? This right? is before the Berlin Conference. So there was really before no... the founding of the American Colonization Society, which is an American... Mm -hmm. Institution, okay. The reason why this is confusing me because everybody says that with with, with the Berlin Conference that they, I know America's that we won't get to that point. Right. But, but 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 America wasn't a part of this. They, they weren't colonialists. But but America, I, America was also a part of the Berlin Conference. Yes, they were. They were as, right. supposedly as observer, as an observer, right. and and they they were the first country that actually uh, said, yeah, this is cool. This is cool. Right. I understand that. But they weren't. Tagged as colonialists, like all they wasn't covering it up. In other words, I guess just what I'm trying to say. It seems like the only property that America had was Liberia. Is that true or not true? Well, yes, Liberia was kind of, uh, in many respects, like a commonwealth. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Again, let's let's be clear about Liberia. Mm -hmm. I, I talked about the American Colonization Societies and some of their motivations mm -hmm. for helping to found Liberia. Mm -hmm. And there were different motivations by different abolitionist groups and others. But the mm -hmm. primary motive of the American Colonization Society mm -hmm. was to make slavery more entrenched in the United States by getting rid of the free, the free black population. Or for that matter, even to some degrees, there were certain members that even wanted to get rid of, I guess you might say, uh, rebellious enslaved Africans and send them there, too. So yeah. they wouldn't have to worry I thought they only them. sent them down to Georgia. Never mind. Right. Little, little yeah. joke. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Right. And so, again, this was the origin of the American Colonization Society. Mm -hmm. Let me just also make an, another point, because this has to do a lot with what Blyden encountered when he got there. Remember, he got there in 1850. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, many of the first blacks who went to Liberia, and especially when you look at the first presidents of the Liberia, the first four or five presidents, all of these presidents were indistinguishable from white people. You're talking about as far as pigmentation is going as or, or the, mentality? I'm talking about both. But certainly in pigmentation, the way they look, they were mostly octoroons, quadroon, mulattoes, quadroons, and octoroons, and they provided the hierarchy of the Liberian experiment. And by and large, if you look at the pictures of the first four or five presidents of Liberia, mm -hmm. they were indistinguishable 
from white people. The first mm-hmm. president of Liberia was J.J. Roberts. And they are indistinguishable from white people. So what happened in Liberia was they brought the racial attitudes of America mm. to Liberia mm. and by and large set themselves up mm. in a special category looking the way they did. In essence, it became a situation where they became, ex- in essence, the white people mm-hmm. and everybody else became the black people. The indigenous population, those blacks who came from here and went there, recaptors, whoever was brought to Liberia that mm. didn't look Mm. like the octoroon class or mulatto class or quadroon class. And so they brought the same uh, racial dynamics. So they set themselves up Mm. as being superior over Mm. their Mm -hmm. brethren in the country Mm. Mm. and Mm. operated that way. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Okay, I really don't want to spiral too far because I wanted to stay on Blyden for just a second. But but, but this is so fascinating. This part is so fascinating. Can, um, Can... let me ask you one question. I'm going to stop, and then we can do a part two to continue on Blyden, okay? And the question is this, according to what all all, all, we, all you brought up just now, it seems to me in every situation, I guess we call it the boule, but there's always, it happened in Haiti, happened all these places where you have these folks that are not, let's call them like uh, all the way black, <laughs> you know what I mean? Some sort of pigmentation in them, and they're always the one that's messing us up. I mean, I'm, you understand what I'm saying? I can't even see in South Africa because they created this class they call the coloreds. Right. You know what I mean? And and they, they put them all in managerial positions and they just mess things up for the black black. You know what right. I'm saying? So I'm just trying to tell me about this. What am I talking about? Right now? Well, tell me about you, this because I want to end essence, it. But I want to. In, I, in you know. essence, and there's a book on this. In essence, and I'll tell you the name of the book. I can't remember the author right now. Somewhere here in the house. It's called The Role of the Mulatto in History. Mm. All right. So what you are talking about under conditions in which not only racism in the form of white supremacy takes place, but when you have a situation which <coughs> deals with the oppression of an entire group of people, slavery, mm-hmm. what you have is within that system mm-hmm. where you are creating an understanding of what is important and what is not important, meaning white skin becomes mm-hmm. all important mm-hmm. and all of the privileges that accrue the white skin become all important mm-hmm. and all of the negative aspects of life which accrue to being black are put down. So mm-hmm. when you have a situation like that, a context like that, anyone within that context uh, who approaches looking white or who can claim to have white blood mm-hmm. is given a particular status, which you call colors. Given a status by? By, by not being black. They get privileges by not being black. They get privileges according to their approximation physically or their approximation psychologically to white mm-hmm. people, the people who are in control and power. What I'm saying, though, who, oh, so, so those people in control and power give them the, 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 the carte blanche or the, or, the, or the power to do this. Sometimes so, the people in power give them direct carte blanche to do that, or the people who are in that particular category feel special and feel better simply by their approximation to white skin mm-hmm. and thus act that way. So what happens mm-hmm. is that the whites, in essence, and even Thomas Jefferson talked about this, right, when he discusses in Notes on Virginia who is white mm. and who is not white, right? He goes through this elaborate mm. schematic to make sure that you will always know who's white and who's not white. Mm. But what happens is the approximation to power gives people certain privileges that they need to maintain. And then the only way they're going to be able to maintain that is to act like they are better. It's a class better than the people below them. And so, again... In every situation, what you have here is a buffer group, mm-hmm. right? For black people to even get to the source of power, you got to go through this buffer group, mm-hmm. all right? For black people, quite often, this buffer group historically has been mulattoes, quadrooms, mulattoes, uh, quadrooms, and octoroons who have a loyalty to white people, who have a love of white people. But that does itself does not exclude even regular black people mm. from being screwed up intellectually, yep. you know, psychologically, and still want to do certain things. But you got to go through this class of people. In t- today's society, quite often in the United States, we have mm. other people of color mm. who occupy that position. So if black people take two steps forward. They don't, they don't want to identify with us, of course, mm. But if black people take two steps forward, normally these other groups of colored people are in the middle and quite often block the advancement of black black people because they want to have 
a mm. social relationship with the ruling class, which is white people. I'm mm. not going to name yeah. any of those groups. No, but, but that's, was, that social relationship also yeah. is, is how you, and you do things for friends. So exactly. if socially, if, you, if, if you're in that circle, you are who right. you surround yourself with, the whole exactly. thing. Just because yeah. other people are people of color, does not necessarily mean they're our friends. Of course. Okay. Well, let me let, let me end it right here for for part one. Even though it's more library than Blyden, and we'll just do part two on. Well, we continue you say, on Blyden. Let me just say no, before yeah, we yeah, end. Yeah. When you say more Liberia and Blyden, yeah, I'm saying this particular what we just oh, talked okay. about it was seemed to be more Liberia, which is appropriate. Then 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 when I say Blyden, you, right. you understand what yeah, I'm no. saying? Yeah, no. But see, I, that's what I'm saying. I mm. wouldn't even say that. Mm. Blyden and Liberia are so bound together hmm. that any point in time that you're talking about Liberia, by and large, from 1850 on, you were talking about Blyden. From 1822 to 1847 or 1850, mm. you may be talking directly about the founding of Liberia and how what we talked about earlier. Mm. But from 1850 on, right up until his death, you're talking about Blyden. 